This happened to me a few summers ago. Home from college, I found myself reconnecting with old friends in our small town nestled within the Appalachian Mountains. My closest friend, Elton Hinckley, suggested we take advantage of the balmy weather and organized a hiking trip for our little group. It all started at the Red Rock Trailhead, located outside of Rainer's Gorge, nature's hidden gem. Lush greenery accompanied by the soothing babble of the creek gave us a sense of calm. I miss this place, Elton said as we marched through the forest. We reached a fork in the trail that we didn't notice on the map, Jade Way on one end and Cobalt Cliff on the other. Left or right, pondered Elliot Greaves, gentle giant and science whiz. A coin toss decided it. We took Jade Way. Each stretch of the hike revealed another breathtaking vista. Our camaraderie masked any underlying danger. That evening, as we huddled around our crackling campfire, I shared tales from my freshman year adventures, eliciting laughter and envy. Morning broke with chirping birds and golden light filtering through treetops, nature's alarm clock announcing the sequel to our explorations. The trail appeared different, but captivated us nonetheless with its twists and turns. Late afternoon, Linnea Fortescue, our perpetual go-getter, realized something was off. An odd assortment of items littered the path ahead. A torn sweater, a rusted knife coated with dark stains resembling chewed bubblegum. Our unease grew. Suddenly reined in by fear, we scrutinized every shadow in search of answers, until stumbling upon a campsite not unlike ours just hours before, save for an unnerving amount of blood splattered across assorted personal belongings, scattered about like autumn leaves after a windy storm. Terrified now, and unable to suppress panic, we decided our best chance was to backtrack and quickly scale the steep inclines. The creekside serenity now appeared sinister. We hastened along, each rustling leaf triggering pounding hearts. Regretfully, our desperate conversations prevented us from noticing Salome Blanchard's disappearance, a bright but introverted girl who lagged behind unnoticed. It wasn't long before we came across her lifeless figure strung up in an oak tree. Terror-stricken, we knew one obvious truth. Whoever or whatever did this was among us, and hungry for more. As the day turned into night, we passed the time in hushed whispers, like rabbits waiting for the fox to strike. Jasper Sterling, a weathered business major with ever-practical roots, suggested using our cell phones strategically as makeshift tripwires around the seemingly safe camp perimeter. Regrettably, it seemed none of our phones could capture any signal nor offered any other means of potential rescue. Darkness attempted to infiltrate our fortress of dismay but failed at every turn. Sebastian Koch savagely tore through his backpack to summon a flashlight, valiantly projecting our hopes on a beam in search of relief. There, movement amidst trees as something untold approached from the murk. Initial terror gave way to momentary hope. Had someone heard our cries? But then we saw it. An emaciated man with skin pulled taut over exposed ribs and knuckles, lined with rivulets running red. The glow of his narrowed eyes reflected barren trees, but offered little insight into his twisted soul, resolute in its primal purpose. More emerged from behind grotesque figureheads, their expressions vacant, terrified, and famished all at once. It became tragically clear that they weren't the nocturnal agents of fate that sealed Salome's grisly end. Rather, they were prey, just like us. Blinded by panic, we sent ourselves scattering through the night in a desperate bid to escape the sprawling forest and those gnarled hands gripping logs stained cruelly with blood. We were pawns in a grotesque, twisted game whose sole objective was survival. I sprinted, heart pounding, legs burning as tears blurred my vision, moonlight reflecting on one inescapable certainty— Something monstrous pursued me just steps behind. The muted howls of agony echoed ominously as I pressed on, weakly dodging more twisted trees reaching out like skeletal hands from hallowed tombs. The forest seemed to close in around me with every step I took. My breath came in short gasps, and my heart drummed a rhythm of pure terror. The desperate need for safety propelled me forward, though I knew not where to go. Sebastian, Charlotte, and Mark had all scattered in different directions when the cannibalistic mountain men attacked. They were pursuing us, cracking branches that echoed menacingly in the darkness like the ravenous appetites that dictated their actions. My legs ached from running, but I couldn't afford to stop. 
The horrific images of Salome's gruesome demise urged me on. Out of sheer desperation, I pulled out my phone with trembling hands. No signal. The remote setting and dense trees had effectively trapped us in a nightmarish hell with no means to call for help. I stumbled upon a narrow, overgrown path that seemed somehow familiar. Perhaps we had crossed it earlier before the horror unfolded. With few options left, I followed it blindly through the darkened woods. After what felt like an eternity of running, I saw a flickering light up ahead like some guardian angel come to save us from the bloodthirsty group relentlessly chasing us. As I neared the source, shallow breaths and whimpering filled my ears. Slowing down, with caution overtaking my haste, I found Charlotte crouching by a small fire she had started. Charlotte! My voice was no more than a hoarse whisper as I knelt down beside her. Are you okay? She looked up at me with eyes wide with fright, but managed a nod. We need to keep moving, I urged her. They're still after us. We pressed onwards through the dense brush together, fear urging our weary bodies forward, ever fearful we would hear their shuffling footsteps behind us at any moment. Eventually crashing through a final barrier of vegetation, we burst onto a narrow road, the first sign of civilization we'd encountered since that initial dreadful encounter. We stood there, panting, the taste of salvation bittersweet, as Mark and Sebastian's absence weighed heavily on our minds. There was simply no time to wonder about their fate. We needed to find help immediately. Just then, headlights gleamed in the distance, and we wasted no time flagging down what appeared to be a truck. A middle-aged man with a kind, concerned gaze stepped out cautiously, immediately questioning our distressed visages. Please help us, Charlotte gasped. There's a group of people trying to kill us in the woods. Without hesitation, he gestured for us to get into his truck. Get in, he called urgently. I'll take you to the nearest town. As soon as we pulled away from that accursed forest, the truck driver dialed the local authorities who quickly set out to search the area on our behalf. At first light, a distressing call came through. Bodies had been found, Mark and Sebastian among them, mercilessly mutilated by those who had stalked and terrorized us throughout the night. When realization struck that they were truly gone, lost to a cruel, vicious fate, Charlotte and I could only cling to each other as relief fused with overwhelming grief. In time, morning would surely overtake us both. A fierce, haunting anger targeted at those mountain men who had taken everything from us. They had hunted down precious lives like animals, leaving only pain, heartache, and an insidious darkness in their ravenous wake, one that would likely shadow us for years to come. But for now, even as it all began just days prior, all that was left for Charlotte and me was an inexplicable bond forged in the fire of horror. Together we would forge forward, amplifying those lost voices of Sebastian and Mark, ensuring that our story would resound with others and that our fallen comrades would not have suffered in vain. Chilling memories behind us, we watched sunrise spread across the horizon like a forgiving balm, signaling an end to the nightmare and the first traces of hope burning through the dark clouds above. This happened to me six years ago, while traveling through the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. I had always enjoyed hiking, so I thought nothing of exploring a remote trail during my weekend getaway. My name is Daniel Seaver, a 33-year-old mechanic from Pittsburgh. The town at the base of the mountain had only a few hundred residents, all of whom seemed to know each other. I met two other hikers in town, Maya and Sam, a married couple originally from Maine. We agreed to venture out into the wilderness together. The first day of our hike was uneventful. We shared stories about our lives. Maya was a nurse, and Sam was an electrician. We laughed together about our common frustrations and listened attentively when one of us shared something more personal. It wasn't until the second day that we stumbled upon something strange. An empty campsite lay abandoned, belongings scattered around as if someone had left in a hurry, or worse, been dragged away. Concerned, we decided to stick closer together and became more cautious as we continued hiking. When night fell, we gathered around a fire for warmth and comfort. The full darkness enveloped us as an unsettling quiet settled around our camp. Maya spoke up first, stating how weird it felt to be surrounded by these silent woods. 
Sam agreed, unease painting his features. A sudden gunshot pierced through the silent night air like a thunderclap, jolting us from our quiet moment. Panic set in as we scrambled for cover, hiding behind nearby trees and bushes for safety. Before my eyes could adjust to the darkness, I saw a hulking figure emerging from the shadows, heavily built and donning ragged clothes stained with what appeared to be blood. The figure held a rifle and scanned the area intently, but said nothing. Fear pulsed through me as I clutched my small pocket knife tightly. I knew I had seen a monster. This being was certainly no ordinary man, and its viciousness was palpable in the moonlight as it stalked the surrounding forest. While Maya, Sam, and I managed to avoid detection for the moment, we knew that we couldn't hide forever. With tense whispers, we agreed to swiftly move through the forest, hoping to outrun whatever menace hunted us. We knew that splitting up would be dangerous, so we clung to each other as we plunged into the darkness. As we moved silently through the dense woods, I couldn't help but frantically look over my shoulder, convinced that at any moment I would see this monstrous figure charging towards us with the hunger of a ruthless predator. We heard the distant sound of shots occasionally ringing out, an unsettling reminder of our impending doom. However, our luck seemed to have run out when Sam let out a pained grunt after stepping on a sharp rock. His yell echoed beyond the trees, surely catching the attention of our relentless pursuer. My heart raced as I sensed danger close by. We didn't have time to tend to Sam's wound. He bit his lip hard and hobbled alongside us as we hurried along, desperately seeking a way out. The looming threat spurred us on, adrenaline replacing fatigue in our battered bodies. In the distance, we spotted what looked like an old building partially hidden amongst the trees, a possible refuge for us to hide in and regroup. Out of options and exhausted beyond measure, we decided to make a break for it. As we began our final sprint towards safety, I couldn't suppress a feeling deep in my gut that something about the situation was disturbingly familiar. As the old building grew closer, we noticed its decayed walls and broken windows. The place seemed abandoned, and though it wasn't an ideal hiding spot, we couldn't be choosy. As I helped Sam limp towards it, I couldn't shake the familiar feeling that haunted me since we started running. I pushed open the creaky door, grimacing as it made a loud noise that could easily alert the mountain men following us. We entered cautiously and found ourselves in a room filled with debris and remnants of furniture. Carefully, we moved deeper into the building, feeling for hidden dangers in the dark. That's when they came. The mountain men. They were tall and burly figures with long, disheveled hair and tattered clothes, carrying weapons as brutal as their appearance. A multitude of scars decorated their rugged faces, testifying to the life of violence they led. Those men had no trace of humanity left in them, searching only to satisfy their insatiable hunger for human flesh. Sam let out a quiet groan as they entered the room. He collapsed onto the floor from exhaustion and pain. The thud he made caught their attention instantly. My heart sank for a moment, before instincts kicked in. There was nothing else to do but run. As I sprinted through the crumbling building with every ounce of energy left in me, their guttural growls echoed through the corridors, closing in relentlessly. Sam's injury made it impossible for him to stand up and battle against his imminent fate. Just as I thought all was lost, a ray of hope appeared in the form of a narrow window leading outside. Without a second thought, I leaped out head first into the cold night air. Seconds later, crashing sounds ensued behind me. These cannibalistic mountain men had one goal in mind, catching their prey no matter what it takes. As I made my descent towards some bushes below, I glimpsed one of them coming to the window to pursue me. Fortune favored me when I realized they struggled to fit through the small gap. This gave me precious moments to get away and find help before they figured a way out. I knew that Sam and I couldn't do this alone. We needed help. It was near impossible to call anyone in this remote area, as signal strength was scarce, but I had to try. With hands shaking from fear and exertion, I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed the emergency number. As it rang, I kept moving, refusing to stop in fear of being caught. Miraculously, someone picked up on the other end. Barely able to catch my breath, I relayed our situation as quickly as possible. While waiting for their arrival, I hid behind some dense foliage just away from the building, lying low. The mountain men eventually exited the structure after finding an alternative route, 
They sniffed the air, feral eyes scanning around for any signs of prey. My heart pounded violently, but I didn't dare move. Hours later, sirens pierced the silence like a beacon of hope cutting through the darkness of despair. As law enforcement officers approached cautiously, weapons drawn, they found Sam miraculously still alive, grievously injured yet clinging on to life with every ounce of strength he had. The mountain men scattered into the depths of the forest as if they dissolved into the shadows themselves. Their monstrous figures vanished while the officers attended to Sam's injuries and called for backup. Though none of us could have anticipated those terrifying events, we lived to see another day, all because of courage and determination in those moments where it mattered most. As days passed into weeks, my mind often wandered back to that harrowing night when we scrambled for survival against bloodthirsty fiends masquerading as human beings themselves. Authorities continued their search and investigation regarding the cannibalistic mountain men. In the aftermath, a veil of bitter reminders slipped over our lives like an invisible shadow. Memories of that dreadful encounter haunted us in different ways. Sam's wounds healed, but left gruesome scars as a constant reminder of the night. Whereas my psyche bore the marks of a familiar darkness, I couldn't quite place. Regardless, we prevailed and emerged from this nightmare as changed people who will never forget how close we came to death's door that fateful night, or the whispered prayers for rescue we held so dearly in our hearts. This happened to me about a decade ago, when I took a road trip to Crater Lake, Oregon. I was traveling then with my college buddies Harris, Stellan, and Clementine. Being raised in Texas, it was the first time I traveled so far up north. Stopping at a gas station in Klamath County, we met Ezekiel, an elderly gentleman serving us gas. He mentioned a shortcut off the main road that could save us an hour, but warned us some wild locals lived that way. We laughed it off. The less traveled path lured us too much. As we advanced down the dusty road, tall evergreens towered over our car, casting shadows as twilight approached. We turned around a bend and suddenly stumbled upon a collection of derelict trailers arranged in haphazard formation. Stellan stopped the car instantly to inspect the vehicles before us. Hey guys, he called out. I think somebody needs help. Hearing moans from one of the trailers, all of us cautiously approached it. As we opened the door to the trailer, something terribly wrong hit our senses. We saw blood-stained clothes, and then an injured man on the floor begging for help. He screamed as he grabbed Clementine's hand. They're coming back. You must leave. The sound of a branch cracking echoed nearby. Someone was approaching. Terrified and confused, we were uncertain if we should return to our car or stay put. Stellan suggested hiding within nearby bushes and waiting until whoever was coming went away. We carried out his plan without hesitation. Hearing rapid footsteps getting closer, Harris peeked out before quickly signaling, Three men! Following them were gut-wrenching screams of agony. The men forcibly pulled someone behind them with ropes. It dawned on us that these atrocities were committed by other humans, mountain men who hunted down passers-by for their sickly carnivorous desires. All locals were victims of their cannibalistic behavior. We were trembling in fear, feeling stuck and unable to escape. Clementine suggested calling the police but had no signal, and Harris reasoned they'd be dead by the time help arrived. We decided to take matters into our hands to save the captives mentioned earlier before leaving the area. Stellan led us towards his backpack, where he hid his father's old hunting rifle handed down in secret. The weapon gave us hope and we started preparing ourselves for a confrontation with life-or-death stakes. Creeping silently through the woods surrounding their lair, we followed their tracks which led to what appeared to be their central camp, corpses hanging from tree branches, dismembered inhumanely with blood dripping down. While Stellan struggled to keep his composure, Harris spotted one of them gnawing at a severed arm, its bare bones white against bloodied flesh. The cannibal sported a beard matted with gore, an imposing figure in his scraggly attire. As their terrible feasting continued, Clementine made a plan to cut loose two people tied together against a tree before gesturing us to follow her lead. With Stellan covering us, we managed to make our way over. 
While untying them as fast as possible, Harris nervously muttered that they couldn't outrun these monstrous men if they realized we're escaping. That's when Clementine revealed her final plan. Once they cut loose, I'll create a distraction for everyone else. She insisted so vehemently that it was her choice alone, and we reluctantly agreed. Once the captive's bonds were severed, she shouted at them to run and get help while she tossed a flare into Cannibal's camp. Almost immediately after realizing the commotion, they lunged in our direction, swinging axes with frenzy in their eyes for unwelcome visitors. We took off in heated pursuit, weaving in and out of trees as we fought for our lives. Our hearts pounded as we sprinted through the dense forest, desperately trying to put distance between ourselves and the bloodthirsty cannibals chasing us. Harris whispered a prayer under his breath, while Stellan continued to cover our retreat. I could hear the enraged mountain men howling our names, their voices echoing through the trees. My legs burned as we raced through the underbrush, branches cutting at our faces and hands. We needed a place to hide or a way to lose them in this seemingly endless maze of trees and foliage. Suddenly, the once-bound captives we released shouted for us to follow them. Trapping their breath, they relayed information about an abandoned cabin not too far from where we were. Their hope was that we'd be able to regroup there while forming a plan of escape from these vicious predators. With the howls growing louder and closer, we quickly agreed on this course of action. The once-captured pair led the way, navigating through the undergrowth with impressive speed and determination. Stellan's face grew grimmer by the second, muttering that he wished he had brought more ammunition for his gun. The cabin soon came into view, old and decrepit but still somehow standing strong in this unforgiving wilderness. We hastily entered it, barricading the door with whatever furniture was left inside before huddling together in one corner. Our rescuers introduced themselves as Laura and Ethan. They knew nothing about these man-eating mountain men, except that they'd been ambushed while hiking nearby days earlier. They gratefully thanked Clementine for setting them free and ensuring their survival up until now. Outside, we could hear the snarls and growls of our pursuers getting closer still. We realized calling for help would be futile given how far we strayed from civilization, not to mention that using a phone might give away our hiding spot. We decided to wait in silence and hope that the cannibals would lose interest in tracking us. If luck was on our side, they'd eventually move on to search for easier prey. Time crawled by as we huddled in that ramshackle cabin. I could hear everyone's breaths, uneven in fear and exhaustion. We didn't dare move a muscle, or even whisper, lest our location be revealed. The agonizing hours felt like days, but the relentless baying of our enemies slowly faded further into the woods. Eventually, their presence was completely gone, leaving behind a deafening silence. After what felt like a lifetime, we cautiously emerged from our hiding spot. The cold air stung my lungs as we surveyed the desolate landscape surrounding the cabin. There was no sign of the cannibals, only quiet darkness as far as the eye could see. With trepidation, we began to make our way back toward civilization following Laura and Ethan's guidance. We trod lightly, eyes constantly scanning every shadow for any trace of danger that might re-emerge. No one spoke. The horrors experienced in those woods weighed heavily on us all. Every step forward meant leaving behind another haunting memory. As we finally neared familiar terrain, Harris glanced over at Clementine with gratitude. She had saved our lives and given us a fighting chance against an unimaginable evil. The thought of her courageous actions would forever be etched in our minds. Arriving back in town, battered but alive, we found help and reported the atrocities we had witnessed. A search party was sent out to investigate, but there was never any sign of the cannibals or their gruesome lair. It was as if they vanished into thin air. We may have escaped that chilling forest, but Laura and Ethan's harrowing ordeal couldn't be forgotten or erased from our memories, nor could the screams and howls of those monstrous predators who had hunted us so mercilessly. We survived by staying together, supporting each other during those darkest hours, but the question still lingered long after our ordeal. What happened to those monstrous mountain men? Our hope was that they would never return to prey on innocent souls again, but deep down, we knew that the seed of terror would remain in our hearts forever, hoping we'd never have to face them again.
This happened to me a decade ago, working as a traveling salesman in a small town called Loftridge. I'm James Volenheim, a New Yorker by birth, but I found myself drawn to the open road, meeting new folks every few weeks. That's when everything changed. One day, I pulled into Loftridge's lone gas station, wondering why my GPS had led me here. The man behind the counter seemed skittish. People don't come through much, he explained hesitantly. I could tell there was more to it than that, but figured it best not to pry. I checked into a cheap motel before getting dinner at the only diner in town. Again, faces turned away when I entered, and the tense silence was punctuated by hushed murmurs. A man named Jeremy Blakewell decided to approach me. We made small talk until he fumbled nervously with his coffee cup and lowered his voice. I'm not supposed to say anything, but people have been missing around here lately, Jeremy whispered urgently. People had taken wrong turns close by, stammered Alfred Lydgate, another local who'd overheard Jeremy and had come to join our conversation. I was skeptical of their story, but decided to check things out anyway. Curiosity had always been part of my charm or my downfall, depending on whom you asked. The next day, I left early, following the path where others had disappeared, at least according to Alfred and Jeremy. Gradually, the maintained road gave way to uneven dirt tracks. Suddenly, my car protested against the sudden incline of the mountainous terrain and ground to a halt. Cursing under my breath and regretting this decision already, I climbed out of the car. On foot now through dense woodland that obscured anything beyond twenty feet ahead or behind me as it was quickly swallowed by an eerie silence. My instincts screamed, Turn back! But it was too late. Up ahead I spotted fresh footprints in the dirt. Curiously enough, they were barefoot and marked with deep cuts. The realization made my heart pound like a war drum. Someone needed my help. I followed the prints deeper into a canyon the silence broken by a faint cry for help echoing in the distance. I turned around, only to see a tall man with a wild beard approaching me, shaking his head briefly. You really shouldn't have come here, he said, nodding at someone out of sight. Before I knew it, another man, even larger than the first, appeared next to me. Why not? The question left my lips without thinking when I suddenly noticed something strange about these fellows— like they were predators, sizing up their prey. Without another word, the mountain men lunged at me as I tried to run, yet tripped on a rock instead. They grabbed hold of me, their ragged nails tearing through clothes to pierce flesh. The taller one clamped down on my arm with a force that sent shivers down my spine as he locked eyes with mine, eyes filled with hunger. That eerie silence only broke when all at once the snarling began. Low and menacing, as if it were coming from deep within their chests. They dragged me back through the woods while skillfully silencing my cries for help with their twisted limbs. Desperation surged through me as thoughts of being someone's late supper plagued my mind. As if responding to my frenzied thoughts, one of them let out an unnerving cackle followed by, We won't eat you just yet. My body went limp with dread when it hit me. These cannibalistic mountain men hunted anyone who accidentally entered this seemingly abandoned town. But Loftridge's isolation would not guarantee them permanent freedom from discovery or capture anymore now, since their latest prey had a fighting spirit. Bloodied, bruised, yet seething with determination, this New Yorker would do everything possible to ensure he wouldn't become another face in the missing person reports. Determined to survive, I searched for a way to escape as they dragged me deeper into the woods. My thoughts raced, considering every possibility. They hadn't killed me yet, so there was still time. I became acutely aware of the surrounding sounds. A branch snapped in the distance, and water flowed nearby. The water caught my attention. Thirsty? One of the mountain men sneered, noticing my focus on the sound. Here you go. He shoved me into a nearby creek submerging my face briefly before pulling me back up by my hair. Despair turned into an idea. If I could somehow maneuver my body to wrap around one of the men holding me, maybe I could force him into the water with me and flee while he struggled to get out or drown him in case he pursued me afterward. As I prepared to enact my plan, an unsuspecting figure appeared before us. A hiker. His eyes widened in horror at our grisly group. I tried to call for help, but there's no signal here. He desperately offered an explanation for his intrusion. The mountain men saw him as a threat, 
and released me to lunge at him. Seizing this opportunity, I sprinted away, ignoring the agonizing pain that shot through my bruised body. Although it was tempting to look back and see if they were chasing me or focused on their new prey, I couldn't risk slowing down for even a second. After what felt like hours running through the thick forest, I stumbled upon Loftridge's outskirts. Exhausted and disoriented, relief washed over me as I finally reached some semblance of safety. Quickly finding a vehicle, likely an abandoned pickup truck left behind in haste, I scoured the interior for keys or any other potential defensive items, but couldn't find any. Determined not to stand still out in the open and vulnerable any longer, I fashioned a rudimentary weapon using materials like rusty nails and shards of glass found in the truck bed. It wasn't much, but it would have to do until I could find help or at least a working phone to call for assistance. Finally locating the main road leading out of Loftridge, my makeshift weapon in hand, I began my careful journey back towards civilization. Every noise I heard, from rustling leaves to crunching stones underfoot, made me nervously glance over my shoulder, anticipating one of those cannibalistic mountain men emerging from the shadows to recapture me. Daylight waned as I trudged down the road, painstakingly slow due to my injuries and heightened paranoia. Suddenly, ahead just around a bend in the road, lay a miraculous sight. The town sheriff whose patrol brought him to our nightmarish stomping grounds. Gasping for air between words, I recounted my ordeal and the fate of the unfortunate hiker who had crossed paths with us. My voice trembled with exhaustion and fear as I spoke. The sheriff listened intently as he eased me into his vehicle to check on my wounds. Once he confirmed they weren't life-threatening, we took off down the same road I'd been precariously limping along just moments earlier, bound for safety and medical treatment. While making our way back towards civilization, the sheriff updated me on the ongoing search for others who'd vanished around Loftridge in recent months. Unfortunately, it seemed suboptimal terrain and signal quality significantly hampered rescue efforts in these parts. As we drove further from Loftridge and its gruesome secrets, extreme relief washed over me. Gratitude that I had survived despite insurmountable odds confronting those monstrous beings that preyed on unsuspecting passers-by amid that desolate place. Yet that relief felt tinged with sadness, too. Thoughts lingered on those who'd crossed paths with the mountain men and been devoured, especially that poor hiker who'd merely been at the wrong place at the wrong time. Despite escaping, those blood-curdling memories and cries for help would haunt me forever. I vowed to fight alongside law enforcement against this lurking evil, even if it meant revisiting that cursed town and confronting the demons lurking deep within Loftridge. No one else should ever have to suffer the same fate. This happened to me a couple of years ago, right before I left my hometown of Elwood, Indiana. I was living alone in my uncle's old farmhouse after he passed away, fixing it up to prepare for sale. My name's Deacon Meadows, a former car salesman with a knack for telling relatable stories at social gatherings. One morning, while walking along the wooded edge of the property, I stumbled upon something strange and unsettling, a disturbed patch of soil with bits of torn clothing and what seemed like mangled human remains buried nearby. Filled with dread, I immediately phoned the police. Detective Langdon Jacobs arrived and started examining the scene. Can't say I've seen anything like this before, he muttered. Why wouldn't they just bury the entire body, I asked, my skepticism growing. Can't say for sure. We'll run tests and see what turns up, Detective Jacobs replied. As we waited for more backup and forensic experts to arrive, we began to notice an odd smell permeating through the trees. It carried with it a faint trace of rotting meat. I mentioned to Detective Jacobs that I'd heard rumors about a group of deranged mountain men in this area who were reputedly cannibalistic. He acknowledged having heard those rumors but claimed that they had never been substantiated by evidence. The detective theorized that maybe these mountain men were responsible for the gruesome scene before us. Over time, as we discussed our lives and background further, more officers and forensic investigators arrived. The site was soon abuzz with activity each officer careful not to disrupt any evidence as they photographed and cataloged every detail. Weeks later, after following leads and conducting searches in conjunction with local law enforcement, 
a handful of grizzly cases involving cannibalism emerged in the surrounding forests across Indiana state lines. Mountain men sightings grew increasingly frequent. A tall figure with long, matted hair, skin like worn leather, impossible for anyone to forget. I was involved in the initial search party, accompanied by law enforcement officers and other civilians who volunteered their time. Together, we cautiously advanced into the dense foliage, anxious while surveying the terrain for any trace of the culprits or their victims. One of our dogs, a gruff German shepherd called Whiskey, suddenly bolted forward with a frenzy in his eyes, barking as he crossed a narrow creek. We followed him into an open clearing centered around a dilapidated shack made of logs and animal hides. The ground appeared stained dark brown, causing me to shudder at the implication. Whispers fluttered anxiously between volunteers as we covered our noses from the stench with bandanas. A growing sense of urgency pervaded the air as we speculated about what was inside. Lighting beside a doorframe revealed bloody handprints smeared across it. Fear and anger warred within me, and I could tell that others felt it too. "'Are we going to bust that door down or what?' someone asked gruffly. We shared a grim nod, steeling ourselves for any terror within. As we braced against one another, preparing to bring the door crashing down, one of my fellow volunteers made an offhand comment that would have been funny under different circumstances. "'Pour one out for our friend Whiskey. That heroic dog deserves a shot at least.' "'Don't jinx it,' I responded before taking a deep breath. With a surge and enormous force, we rammed the door open together, with guns drawn, to behold the gruesome tableau inside. The room was staged like some sickening ceremonial space, signs of violence and degradation everywhere. Cautiously, we stepped into the gruesome interior, careful not to disturb the remnants of whatever horrifying acts had taken place. The shack was dimly lit, casting eerie shadows over the carnage. Gore covered every surface, and broken furniture lay scattered on the floor. My eyes scanned the room, searching for any remaining threats. The bloodied handprints seemed like a warning, urging us to leave while we could. But we couldn't back down now. There were too many lives at stake. I hoped for strength as I led my team into what was undeniably a terrifying situation. As we moved through the shack, it became abundantly clear that it had been inhabited by a group of cannibalistic mountain men who were hunting down and killing people who took a wrong turn into their territory. Their monstrous behavior was appalling. My team approached carefully, preparing for any sudden attacks. This would be no easy task. Why haven't we called for backup? One of my teammates asked nervously. Too late now, I replied curtly. They're close. We carried on with our hearts pounding and our weapons ready, knowing that these brutal killers could strike at any moment. Our continued silence only heightened the sense of doom pervading the air around us. As we pressed deeper into the shack, we glimpsed frightful details of what had befallen victims who'd ventured this way before us. Strewn limbs and gnawed bones filled corners and crevices. It was then that my heart broke for them and their families, who would never know what exactly happened to them. Through our grim resolve, we eventually stumbled upon the quarters of these repulsive men, a filthy space with crude beds made from animal fur and rotting wooden platforms. We steeled ourselves against the cacophony of smells, human waste mixed with drying blood and putrid meat. And then it happened. Three burly men with matted beards and wild eyes abruptly lunged at us from the shadows. Their fierce expressions and monstrous demeanors sent waves of terror coursing through our veins. Reacting instinctively, we opened fire, our bullets sparing no time finding their unhinged targets. Yet they continued their frenzied charge, valuing our demise over their own safety. It was clear these savage people were not accustomed to failure or mercy. With every step they got closer, inching nearer to satisfying their insatiable appetite for human flesh. With our backs against the wall, we fought for survival, utilizing every bit of strength we could muster. Then, as abruptly as it had started, it ended. The attackers lay motionless on the filthy floor, defeated by a combination of our determination and overwhelming numbers. The danger was finally over. However, the heart-wrenching image of their twisted faces would haunt us for years to come. In the immediate aftermath, we took a moment to regroup and check for injuries sustained during the ferocious attack. It was nothing short of a miracle that none of us had been badly hurt. We knew that we were extremely fortunate. 
We exited the shack with heavy hearts and trembling legs, deciding that taking in the sight one more time would do little to help comprehend what we'd just faced. We retreated to more familiar territory. After sharing details of this blood-chilling experience with backup and calling in law enforcement to handle the situation further, we parted ways, each lost in our thoughts and forever changed by what had occurred. I often found myself reflecting on those dark events, struggling to come up with answers for why such horrors existed in this world. I couldn't make sense of it. There was simply no excuse or explanation for such appalling behavior. Over time, however, I came to deeply appreciate my fellow volunteers' bravery under such harrowing circumstances. Their actions saved countless lives, and our camaraderie was forged in the adversity we'd shared. Whiskey, our tenacious German shepherd, received commendations for leading us to the terror that mangled human souls so grotesquely. Though I could never forget the nightmare of that dilapidated shack and its gruesome inhabitants, I channeled my memories into fueling my resolve in continuing to serve my community and help those in need. And though the agonizing screams of their victims would forever echo in my mind, I knew that no one else would suffer at the hands of those brutal cannibals ever again. This happened to me a few winters ago near Clancy, Montana. I was out hiking, trying to clear my head after a rough breakup. My name's Jerome Fitzpatrick, and I work as an accountant at a local firm. Not exactly exciting or adventurous. So, these weekend hikes were my escape from monotony. Little did I know that this particular hike would change my life forever. While reaching the trail's halfway point, I noticed something odd draped over a nearby branch. It looked like a blood-soaked piece of clothing and a rotten smell filled the air. This should have been the first red flag, but I blamed it on some careless hunters and moved on. As I continued down the unfamiliar path, crisp leaves crunching beneath my boots, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin. Intrigued by this finding, I opened the creaky door and stepped in. The place looked like it hadn't been touched in years, furniture covered in dust-filled sheets and old photographs scattered on the floor. That's when it hit me. Something was genuinely wrong. There were chilling signs of struggle across every surface, with rusty chains lying next to an overturned chair and disturbing graffiti painted on the moldy walls. The cabin felt icy cold and eerie, as if evil lingered just out of sight. My cell phone had no reception, so calling for help wasn't an option making me feel vulnerable and scared for my life. While carefully studying the room, I noticed muddy footprints leading off into the foggy distance. Overlapping trails dotted with blood droplets mocking me as they disappeared into the misty woods. With dread creeping into every nerve of my trembling body, they beckoned me where no man ever dreams of going. But as fear knocked at my resolve, reminding myself that this was possibly a twisted prank or dealing with unfortunate squalor born from abject poverty life encountered in rural Montana at times gave me the last threads of courage left in my heart. I chose to seek professional help in town hoping their familiarity with the area could provide answers. As I hastily walked back to the cabin's entrance, a strange rustling behind me caught my attention. As if lurking just past the shadows was nature itself twisted into something perverse, ready to feast on my ignorance. It was then that I saw them, a group of gaunt, deranged men emerging from the mist. Their faces still haunt me, hollow eyes with wild hair and cracked, bloodied lips revealing rotting teeth. These cannibalistic mountain men were grotesque manifestations of humanity's darkest instincts. I sprinted out of the cabin and back onto the trail, tripping over rocks and branches in my haste. Panicked gasps escaped me as I tried to shout for someone, anyone, but nobody had ever dared venture this far away from civilization. The mountain men let out guttural cries that pierced through the forest as they chased me down. It wasn't long before they were too close for comfort. Instead of running straight onto their territory, I decided to use the environment to my advantage. After seeing an old tree nearby with low branches, I scrambled up, hiding amidst its gnarled limbs. I could hear them all around me as they searched for their prey. Their guttural growls like some predatory creatures spread fear throughout my body like ice finally taking hold on a lake's surface after days of suspenseful cracking and spreading breaks under its collapsing surface. I breathed as quietly as possible, 
trying not to give away my position in the tree. The mountain men circled below, sniffing the air and grunting between themselves like a pack of rabid animals. If I could outlast them, I might stand a chance of surviving. As the minutes ticked by, their frustration seemed to grow. A few lashed out at each other with unsettling ferocity. They were capable of inflicting considerable harm, not just on me, but their own kind too. After what felt like hours, they began to move away, and finally disappeared from sight. I waited for a while longer before deciding it was safe to climb down from my hiding place. Once I reached the ground, I resisted the urge to run straight back toward civilization, as I didn't want to risk running into the mountain men again. Instead, I opted for a slow, cautious descent through the forest. My ankle throbbed in pain, and I recognized it was probably sprained from earlier during my frantic escape. Still, there was no time for self-pity. I had to keep moving if I wanted any chance of living through this ordeal. As the sun began to set, my dread intensified. Night provided perfect cover for those inhuman creatures. With every snap and rustle of a branch or leaves underfoot, panic threatened to overtake me, but I knew panicking would only hasten a gruesome end. My rumbling stomach reminded me that food would soon become a priority too. In an attempt to satiate it temporarily and secure some much-needed sustenance for the journey ahead, I picked wild berries along the way with cautious hands. Croaking noises echoed loudly as frogs made their presence known. However, I dismissed them quickly and focused on distance. Days passed, or was it longer? Time seemed hard to measure without access to daylight, and exhaustion started taking its toll on my body. Still not completely clear of the mountain men, I knew I couldn't risk stopping for more than a few moments to catch my breath. It was while I was resting against a tree that I heard the faint murmur of voices in the distance. Cautiously, I listened intently as the sound grew closer. Unlike before, these voices sounded like regular human beings instead of those cannibalistic killers. Was it possible? Could they be hikers or forest rangers who might help me? Remaining concealed behind trees and bushes, I slowly moved toward the group of people, hoping that they could be trusted. As they came into view, I saw that they were a small search party, outfitted with gear and backpacks. I was saved. Summoning every ounce of strength left in me, I stumbled out from my cover and called for their attention. Startled, the search party immediately came to my aid and helped me sit down. As their gear indicated, they were indeed forest rangers who had been looking for me after my mysterious disappearance during the hike. They tended to my wounds and offered food and water. Their kindness almost felt surreal after experiencing so much horror. While some stayed back to ensure my safety, others went ahead to notify authorities about my discovery. As we made our way back to the base of the mountain, an overwhelming sense of relief washed over me. It seemed like a nightmare finally coming to an end. The rangers led me through unmarked trails leading back to the safety of civilization and away from the horrifying grasp of those monstrous mountain men. As we left those treacherous woods behind, leaving everything that happened with them, I felt a deep appreciation for life surge beneath my ribs, along with a fragile hope evoked by each carefully placed step forward toward a fresh start. That ordeal taught me a lot about human nature, how easy it is for darkness to consume us, and that the dwelling of evil is not limited to folklore or legends. As long as I live, I will never venture into the wilderness alone, and will always respect nature's unknown depths. I will cherish the memory of my rescue, reminiscing about the heroes who saved and guided me back to safety, nursing an infinite appreciation for them in my heart. As for those twisted mountain men, they will be relegated to the foul corners of my thoughts, a chilling reminder of what can fester in our world's hidden places. Perhaps some mysteries should remain forever unsolved, lest we risk falling victim to them ourselves. This happened to me quite some time ago while hiking in the Appalachian Mountains. I met two fellow travelers, Iris Delaney and Frank Melendez. We shared a laugh about how all of our names were considered uncommon, and we bonded quickly. The landscape was breathtaking, with dense forests on every side. Iris, Frank, and I pitched our tents by a serene stream that ran through a valley. All seemed normal until the next morning, 
when we discovered traces of blood and a torn shirt snagged on a nearby tree branch. In town, we heard rumors of unsavory characters lurking in the area, rarely seen but believed to be dangerous. We brushed it off. After all, evil people aren't responsible for everything strange that happens. We continued our journey deeper into the forest. One evening around the campfire, Frank shared stories from his tumultuous childhood, making us feel more connected in this eerie location. The three of us kept vigil overnight due to paranoia. That next day we found an old shack with signs of recent activity. Broken glass and footprints marred the dusty floor. Growing increasingly unnerved, Frank tried to call for help on his phone but got no signal. Iris suggested sticking together to avoid attracting unwanted attention. Throughout our hike, we observed signs of violence, deep gouges on tree trunks and bloody leaves underfoot. We became targets one night when unseen entities hurled rocks at our tent. Narrowly dodging them, Iris noticed shadows across the forest floor, emaciated figures watching just beyond our campsite before disappearing into the darkness. A man stumbled toward us in tattered clothes, missing an arm and barely alive. He gasped his last breath with a warning. They're hunting! Run! With no time to mourn him, we fled deeper into the woods. Pressed by terror, we didn't know if those relentless creatures were cannibalistic mountain men, survivors of an unknown catastrophe, or something far worse. We never saw their faces, but when they briefly emerged into the light, their sickly skin practically glistened while blood dripped from their sharp instruments. Exhausted and ragged, we stumbled upon the remnants of an abandoned property. Iris tripped over a strangely symmetrical mound of earth and, unfortunately for her, warned our nearby tormentors of our location. They closed in. We heard unnerving laughter echo through the forest. Frantic, I began digging at the mound with my bare hands in an attempt to arm ourselves. I uncovered a metal box containing various antique items, a revolver among them. Frank grabbed it excitedly and urged us to head down a hidden path behind the house. Our stalkers seemed momentarily confused by their prey's sudden directional change. Seizing this momentary relief, Iris whispered to me that she was dying to get back home to her husband and daughter. Her confession filled me with immense sadness. Something like this brought us together yet could also end our lives so abruptly. The sun dipped below the horizon as Frank experienced gut-wrenching anxiety. He knew he had three bullets for protection, but worried about using all of them on one antagonist while another lurked nearby. The twisted creatures played on his fears by mocking him from the shadows. He heard their chilling glee and indecipherable whispers which grew louder by the minute. Beaten down by terror, feeling as if we would soon be consumed by these relentless monsters, Frank mustered a final burst of courage and stepped into the open. Frank's sudden boldness caught the attention of the mountain men, who rushed towards us with terrifying speed. These cannibalistic men were filthy and disheveled, their eyes wild with hunger. Their blood-stained clothes hinted at the unspeakable acts they had recently committed. As they neared, I yelled at Iris and Frank to keep running down the path. The reality of our situation dawned on me. We were being hunted by these ruthless creatures in an isolated forest. We couldn't call for help because our phones had no signal, rendering us completely alone. Continuing down the path, we came across a cabin with a faint light still flickering inside. We made a quick decision to take refuge within the structure, hoping to buy some time as we thought of a plan to escape our new enemy. Inside the decrepit cabin, we quickly barricaded the door and windows using anything we could find, old furniture and rusty tools strewn around the dusty room. Frank's hands trembled as he clutched the revolver tightly. Meanwhile, Iris scanned the cabin in search of any useful items for our escape. Outside, the cannibalistic mountain men seemed to relish in drawing out our fear. They banged on the walls and windows of the cabin while laughing maniacally, sending shivers down our spines. Realizing that it was only a matter of time before they broke through our makeshift barricades, I felt compelled to act before it was too late. In moments of sheer bravery or reckless desperation, I prepared myself for a confrontation with these monstrous men. I grabbed an old hunting knife left lying on a dusty shelf in hopes of somehow defending myself if needed. I urgently whispered to Frank and Iris that we needed to leave through the back door now or risk getting cornered within this cabin by our relentless stalkers. Filled with renewed determination by my sudden change of heart, 
all three of us rushed out of the back door and into the eerie darkness of the forest. As we sprinted through the trees, Frank fired a shot at one of the approaching mountain men. The deafening sound pierced the silence of the woods and gave us a momentary advantage in our flight. However, it also alerted the other cannibals to our exact location. We continued running, knowing that they would not cease their pursuit. Our only hope was to find our way back to civilization before they finally caught up with us. But our desperate efforts had left us exhausted, and all too soon we were struggling to keep moving forward. As we began to lose steam, Iris suddenly tripped on an exposed tree root, and Frank made the decision to stop and try to fight off our attackers with his remaining bullets. Though he managed to take down another pursuer in a brief confrontation, it became clear that our chances of winning this battle were rapidly dwindling. We couldn't keep moving at a pace fast enough to outrun them. Seemingly out of nowhere, we spotted headlights approaching from the distance, a vehicle driving down an unfamiliar road within the forest. I shouted for help loud enough for the driver to notice our distress and swerved towards us just in time as one of our pursuers lunged from behind me. The vehicle struck him hard and brought his gruesome advance to an abrupt halt. The driver turned out to be a local man who happened upon us by sheer luck while he was driving home from work. He drove Iris, Frank, and me as fast as possible out of that wretched forest while we recounted our horrifying ordeal. He told us that there had been various reports of people going missing within those woods, but had never witnessed anything himself until now. Summoning all our courage, we contacted local authorities who organized a thorough search of the area. Body parts belonging to recent victims were uncovered amongst grisly scenes of carnage. Frank, Iris, and I struggled to come to terms with the reality of our narrow escape. Dedicating ourselves to raising awareness about the dangers lurking within that forsaken forest, we vowed never to forget the unspeakable terrors we had encountered at the hands of those cannibalistic mountain men. This happened to me about a decade ago. I was driving on a deserted road deep in the Great Smoky Mountains. My name is Elias Hauser, a software developer hailing from Cleveland. The decision to take the longer scenic route to my brother's wedding was momentarily satisfying. That is, until I got lost. The radio played an old tune I vaguely recognized, its familiarity both comforting and eerie. My map lay crumpled and useless on the passenger seat as I grappled with the winding road my headlights fumbling through the dark. Up ahead I spotted a rundown gas station beside a seemingly abandoned diner. I pulled in, hoping someone could help with directions. Parking next to a battered pickup truck, I beamed upon noticing an elderly woman sweeping the diner's porch. Hi ma'am, I greeted cautiously. You won't believe it, but I took a wrong turn and got terribly lost. Murphy's Law reigned supreme, she cackled as she informed me that her phone line had been dead for days. She assured me, though, that once in a blue moon someone stumbled onto their little haven in the mountains seeking similar guidance. I felt discomfort as she said there was no need to worry. Her sons would be back soon with their hunting spoils. They knew those mountains better than anyone and could escort me safely to civilization. She invited me into the diner for coffee. The taste buds in my mouth begged for something stronger. Liquid courage would suit me better amidst this unsettling encounter, but coffee seemed appropriate. Katie Baker was our spunky waitress for the evening. She effused familiarity with the woman's sons, apparently key figures in these remote parts. Hank's dynamite stew is everyone's favorite around here, she grinned mischievously before disappearing into the kitchen. From my tiny window booth, my paranoia morphed normalcy into sinister tones as reality swiftly became a nightmare. I glanced around, studying the other patrons. Distant stares and gruff voices echoed through the diner, paradoxically crowding its desolate atmosphere. Suddenly, two burly figures stormed through the door, chilling air swirling around them. Dissonant laughter filled my ears as they approached their mother. The elderly woman beamed with pride as her sons displayed their bloody, unidentifiable prey slung over their broad shoulders. I hesitated but pushed myself to stand before them. Excuse me, I said nervously. Your mom mentioned that you could help me get back on track. I lost my way and really need to find a route out of here. The brothers stared at me, 
sizing me up from head to toe, their silence pulsing in my ears. Finally, the taller one exchanged brief words in hushed tones with his teary-eyed mother before nodding at me. Get your things, he said gruffly. Back on the road, the darkness turned suffocating as we drove in eerie silence, navigating into the core of the mountain's forbidden territory. Suddenly, they slammed the brakes. My heart lurched in sync. Before us lay a clearing littered with human remains, some old, some disturbingly fresh, intertwined with bones and clumps of torn clothing. Panic surged through me as reality sank its razor-sharp claws into my consciousness. These weren't any mountain men. They were cannibalistic predators. I considered calling for help, but my phone had no signal in this remote area. Distracted by the gruesome scene, I didn't notice the larger brother sneaking up behind me until he grabbed me and threw me to the ground. My breath hitched as I hit the cold earth, pain blooming from the impact. Run, said the taller brother, staring at me emotionlessly, or you die here. Physically shaken, I ran into the shadowy woods without looking back. My lungs burned and my legs ached as I stumbled through the darkness, branches whipping at my face. Dry leaves crunched underfoot as I pushed on, but fear motivated me to keep moving. By sheer luck, I found a small cave to take refuge in. Hearing heavy footsteps approaching, I made myself as invisible as possible within its confines and held my breath. One of the brothers marched past my hiding spot without sparing a glance in my direction. Seizing the opportunity to slip away once more without him noticing me, my nerves sharpened every surrounding sound and sensation. Determined to escape this nightmare, I cautiously navigated through the dense forest, following what seemed like a path. Hours passed and my body screamed in exhaustion, but giving up wasn't an option. As dawn approached, light filtered through the trees and I spotted something that gave me hope. Tire tracks. Desperation propelled me forward as I followed the tracks until they led me to a narrow road. Tears threatened to blur my vision. Civilization. Despite being tortured by hunger and fatigue beyond anything I'd ever felt before, I knew stopping wouldn't be wise. Luckily, a passing truck driver saw my worn state and pulled over. Without hesitation or inquiries about how I ended up in such disarray, he offered me a ride back into town. Grateful for his generosity, yet too rattled to partake in small talk with him or anyone else, I barely registered the route his truck took. As we pulled into the town, relief washed over me. Days later, I reported my harrowing experience to the authorities, albeit omitting the parts about stumbling across cannibals and their bloody exploits. Police investigated but found nothing in the mountains, except for abandoned vehicles and a family diner that had been vacant for years. Having confronted a horrifying reality that few others would ever believe, I tried my best to move on from that encounter. Despite my attempts to block them out, the memories of those who succumbed to the mountain men's mercilessness haunted me. I often think about the elderly woman and her sons, how many lives they destroyed, how the slaughter had rooted itself in their existence. Grudgingly, I admire the resilience it must have taken them to survive in such unsettling circumstances. One thing's certain, however menacing and gruesome they appeared, the mountain men were invariably just people, driven by an unspeakable hunger few could understand or condone. Though I survived and eventually returned to my everyday life, a lingering residue of fear remains. It whispers to me every time I journey into an unknown place, reminding me never to underestimate what humanity is capable of when pushed past its limits. And no matter how distant those repulsive memories become, a fragment of true darkness will forever be etched within me. And so I persist, forever cautious and vigilant for threats lurking in places both known and otherwise, all too aware of what horrors might dwell out there, waiting for their next unwitting victim.